computer. Okay, so let's hope that now if you could um, mute yourselves, maybe that will bring the screen arrangement down to where um, I, because I, I don't know if I'm recording what I'm saying, but I think I am. Anyway, let me get started. Acrylic painting. There are so many varieties of acrylics out there and acrylics have just risen to power, so to speak, since in the past, oh, I don't know, 60, 70 years, because essentially acrylic is a plastic and it's made up of polymers and it reacts differently than other paints. Um, it is water soluble and you clean it up with soap and water, but once it's dried, you can't spray it with water and move it around again like you can with watercolor or gouache, which are water soluble. Um, and oil paint is a different animal altogether. That's oil based and that takes much longer to dry. Acrylics dry faster not as fast as watercolor and faster than oil. There's so many different types of acrylic. Um, I don't know what you have in your personal stash. If you have purchased anything, if you have had a, acquired a bunch of art materials over the years, but usually when we talk about acrylic paint, we talk about the tubes such as these, you know, the, and these are your heavy bodied acrylic. You squeeze them out and they're like the consistency of toothpaste. They hold their shape, so to speak, when you squirt them out, they, they come out like, um, like toothpaste. They have a, a certain uh, heavy body quality to them. And these come in tubes. I use a number of brands. This uh, Liquitex Basics is great if you are just starting out. You would graduate up in quality to like a Windsor Newton. A Utrecht that you can get through Dick Blick is a good economy professional grade. They come in student grade and professional grade. Please, even though you might consider yourself a student, buy the professional grade because the quality of the paint is so much better and a little goes a long, longer way than student grade paints that are more, have a lot of filler and not as much pigment. And it's just like if you were cooking, if, if you cook with quality ingredients, the outcome will be better. So there's many of us who buy only extra virgin olive oil because we think of it as being the best and the cleanest and the purest, and we want those ingredients in our food. Same thing with paint. If you're going to splurge on any of the things we talk about, paint, brushes, paper, I would say put the money in the paint. It'll yield the best results for you. So we have heavy bodied acrylics, which come in tubes. Soft bodied acrylics also come in tubes, but they're a little mushier. You also have fluid acrylics. Now that to me, the top of the line acrylic brand is Golden. Golden paint and Holbein. They make the nicest paints. What I would avoid, uh, I know, Michael's is the only game in town now if you want a brick and mortar art store unless you go into the city to Dick Blick or there's Jerry's Artorama up in Norwalk right off Route 95. That's fun to go there and walk around. It's like a warehouse full of art supplies. It's great. Um, I would avoid, what is the brand at Michael's? Artist Loft or something. It's, it's cheap. Um, but the quality is uh, not so great. So when you buy paint, especially like a fluid acrylic, and these are, these are golden. I want to show one that 
it isn't all drippy. Okay, here it is. On the golden brand, you'll see that there's, they have like diagonal stripes on the label that show you the transparency of that ink color or that paint color. So if it's really opaque, like here on this red, you can barely see the, the diagonal lines because the paint is very opaque where others might be very translucent like this uh, quinacridone gold, which is one of my favorite colors. It's rather translucent because you can see those black stripes underneath that show you how sheer the paint is. And actually they have a real human being strike every bottle with uh, the paint to show how translucent it is. So this just isn't printed on the label. They're actually hand painted with a stripe of color to show you how transparent the color is. On this blue, you can see it's semi-transparent. If you can't see the lines, like that, those are hard to see, then it's a really opaque thick color. Fluid acrylics are runnier and more watery than a heavy bodied acrylic. And in most cases, they are more transparent. So you might get a quality of a layering quality like uh, you might get in watercolor. And the heavy bodied acrylic is more opaque, which is um, like the opacity you, you might find in oils, a, a thick oil, or even gouache. Gouache is more uh, opaque than um, sheer watercolors. So that's to give you an idea of, and you can hear it. You can hear it um, when you shake it. It's, you can hear its liquidity, if that's a word, whereas the tubes are much thicker. They also make, which I don't use, um, pouring acrylics. And in the past couple of years, pouring has become um, like a fad in painting because they have developed a paint. Like if you pour a drop into a pool, of, like if you put, uh, drop, put a drop of red in a pool of the blue, it creates all these cells and there's a chemical reaction that happens and it's, it gets all psychedelic. And it's really cool. But the paint is having a chemical reaction with itself and you're really not like painting you're just kind of pouring and like and reacting to the reaction and saying oh that's cool or maybe if i tilt my canvas this way i can get it to flow that way the takeaway i have gotten from the pouring is when you when you do it you have it slides off the canvas and where's the canvas? Okay, this is like a canvas pad. So we're gonna pretend that this was poured on here. The paint, you're moving it around. More paint is going in to the garbage than you're actually using because there's so much waste in pouring. You can't really salvage all that paint because when you mix all the colors of the rainbow together, it makes brown or neutrals, depending on what they are. So personally, I find pouring a waste of paint, but I'm sure it's fun. It's something that I'm sure kids would love to do. And I know that they have done it in um, many programs with many people who um, are fascinated with painting. But um, it's kind of like when I was growing up, they had the spin art. Remember spin art? You'd squirt some paint on there and start the mower and it would whir around and it makes some cool um, splattery design. But you really weren't actively painting. You were watching the paint react to um, some kind of uh, chemical or physics motion. So, but what we're concentrating on, on is the real activity of painting. So um, what I would also like to talk about besides, you know, we have the, oh, oh, I'm okay, asking to unmute. 
I just, um, so what do you want us to uh, use? I actually have a bunch of fluid um, acrylics called Craft Smart. Okay. That, that, that's, I don't think it's an expensive brand. Um, but I just saw on Amazon that Golden has like an introductory set. Do you, would that be something to buy? Um, what, what you, if you haven't bought already and if you don't own already, I wouldn't buy a whole spectrum of colors. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, do you want a, a heavy, a heavy um, set and then also a fluid set or just one or the other? I would say if you're going to buy, buy the heavy body because mm -hmm. you can make a fluid acrylic from the heavy body. It's mm -hmm. much harder to make a heavy body from the fluid acrylic. Got it. Because what we can add to a heavy body paint, it, we can add water to thin it down. Mm -hmm. uh, but what is preferred is because plastic likes plastic. And basically, um, the fluid acrylic just has more liquid plastic in it than the heavy bodied acrylic. Okay. So what I what I saw on Amazon was like an introductory set of golden uh, heavy body, and it's like six six smaller uh, bottle uh, tubes. Would that be okay? Yeah, what are they asking for it? Does it because golden can be expensive? It depends on the size of the tubes. Um, are, you, are you asking how much it is? Yeah, because I don't want you to make a you know a multi I mean, dollar. I mean, it's, it's like an introductory set for $26. I oh, mean, okay. I don't mind buying it. I how many has six of them in there. Okay, I mean, so it's probably smaller it. tubes than this. Yeah, oh, definitely for sure. It's very yeah. smaller. Yeah, I buy my paint in bulk because mm -hmm. you know, I've been painting larger lately. But if you are just starting out with acrylics and you're not exactly sure if you're going to love it, I would start off with the small two. Okay. They will last a long time. I, If you care for them properly, keep them out of direct sun okay. and um, store them horizontally rather than vertically. I don't know why they tell me that, but they do. Um, I have some tubes of paint that are 15, 20 years old and they're still viable. Just yeah. make sure when you close them, you take a rag and you just clean the, um, what do they call that? Uh, you know, the, like the, the ridges the of the screws, uh -huh. screw top, make sure that's clean. And then, you know, put it on tightly. If you find that it's old and stuck, rinse it under hot water and, and then it will loosen up. If you need to, um, there'll be a, you know, a chemical reaction in it and it will release some of its stickiness or the gluiness. I, I want to try it. I think the tubes are small, but so, and it's like, I get a, a six different colors. So I'm going to try it. Okay. If you only have three colors um you want to get a red a blue and a yellow because okay. that's where all our colors are made from yeah they, um, they have red uh red yellow blue green and black white okay good um i suggest um everybody get a black and a white too mm -hmm. and if you only buy three colors get red blue and yellow Next mm -hmm. week, we're going to do a deep dive into color mixing. So mm -hmm. I, the reason I said you only need one tube of paint today and one brush or whatever it is, I just didn't want you to panic thinking you had to go out and buy all this stuff. And I also didn't know what you may already own. I mean, some mm -hmm. people, um, I know someone is enrolled in one of my other painting classes who said her daughter just moved into the city, left all these art supplies behind. She doesn't want to throw them out. She wants to learn how to paint herself. I said, fine, let's use whatever stuff your daughter left behind. Mm. So um, what we can do to thin down our acrylic paint, you can use water. It's not the most preferred because sometimes it can get streaky. So what they recommend is, I have all kinds of things here. 
matte medium, and I buy the big things because I use a lot of supplies. It can be fluid matte medium or just it might say matte medium. Matte medium has a great versatility because it's used as a glue if we're doing collages. You can also buy it, maybe you've heard of um, something called Mod Podge. If you ever did decoupage or collaging, Mod Podge is the same thing, but it's really not a great quality. Um, I don't know about its chemical makeup, but I I like golden products. And they don't pay me to promote them. I, I wish they did throw some perks my way, but um, I'm just sharing with you what my favorites are. If you have Mod Podge in the house, use it by all means. Uh, and this can be used as a glue if you're doing collage and you're uh, gluing down papers. It can be used to thin down your paint and I'll do a demo on that in a minute. And it can be used as when your painting is dry, you would do a coat of matte medium over the whole painting to seal it. So it's a sealer as well and it will protect your surface. So it has a wonderful uh, versatility to it. You don't need to go out and buy all these things. I want to explain to you what they are, especially if I use them in class. They also make what they call a glazing medium. And that essentially is the same thing. It thins down your heavy paints to make them more transparent if you want layering. Let's say you're doing a sunset and you want the color underneath to, sh to show through the next color and as you graduate your colors up. So glazing medium helps with the transparency. Excuse me. Um, they also make a paint retarder. Sometimes people find that the paint is drying up on them too quickly. Um, and they don't, they're like, I don't want to be rushed into painting faster because I'm focusing on this area right now. You can add a couple drops of paint retarder and it slows the drying process of the paint. They Golden makes a line called open acrylics, which means they stay open longer, meaning their drying time is slower. When we use the term, the paint is still open. That means it's not dry yet. You can still manipulate it. You can still move it around. Acrylic paint, when dry, is not going to budge. You can't remix it. You can't come back in a day or two like you can with oils and still smoosh it around. If you get it on your clothes, I wear a smock because most of my clothes have some kind of paint on them. But um, if you don't want paint on your clothes, wear a smock. If, it, if you get paint on, wash it off immediately, scrub it out immediately because once it dries, it's uh, it's not going anywhere. It's permanently stained. Okay, so, can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, so if, if you happen to have taken one of your classes before and have a nice big bottle of Golden's Matte Medium, yeah. would that also let you do the same thing glazing medium does and make things yes. transparent for a sunset or something? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks. So if you already own Matte Medium, you don't need a glazing medium. Okay. I've acquired these things throughout the years, and I have also subscribed to different art supply subscriptions, especially during COVID. I subscribed to Sketchbox and Art Snacks, which are a monthly, monthly subscription service where they send you a goodie box of art supplies every month, and you don't know what you're going to get. Some of them you can curate your own box. They offer that option once or twice a year. But most of the time, it's just, you know, a treasure trove of new products that the companies are pushing. So that's why I have accumulated a lot of these odd things. You don't need to have, you don't need to own all these things. Now, when we talk about our surfaces, 
our paints, we pretty much covered with the heavy body, the fluid, the open. When we paint, we want to paint on a surface that well receives the paint. So that's, if you've never heard of gesso, that's what I'm going to discuss now. Gesso is a primer and it comes in different ways. It's kind of like when you go to the nail salon and they put a base coat on your nails before they put the actual color. This gesso primer sets up your surface to receive the paint. You don't always have to buy, you don't always have to use gesso, especially if you're first starting out and you're using, you can use watercolor paper. This is just a watercolor pad that I bought. Um, this week at Michael's, they have for this Canson series or brand, buy one, get one half off. So I have watercolor paper. We can also paint. You might not want to go to, you know, to a canvas while we're doing our, pra our, our practices, but you can buy pre-stretched canvases and they say they're pre-treated, which means they put gesso on them already. So it's just not raw canvas because if it was raw canvas and uh, you put paint on it, it would bleed into that fabric, the canvas. And even if it's 100% cotton fiber watercolor paper, the water will, uh, the paint will just absorb into that surface. And whereas on a primed surface, it kind of sits up pretty on top. So gesso is what we put on to treat a surface. You can use like a canvas paper. This is a canvas pad. And it's, it's not a, a mounted canvas like, you know, this one with the wood frame. This is a pad that's sealed on the bottom and the top so it doesn't curl up and buckle um, when you're paint on it. And it does have a canvas texture to it. You can paint on that. Are these pages free treated? I don't know. Does it say genuine for any medium? I mean, it doesn't say if it's been pre-treated with gesso, but I'm going to give a little demo of the gesso right now to show you what I mean. A brush. Oh, and I want to get it. I'm going to talk about brushes next too, because of people always have a lot of questions about brushes. What brush do I use for what? How do I get this effect? But I'm just going to take this canvas paper and show you. I'm going to this. This gesso is kind of liquidy and gesso comes in all different colors. It doesn't have to be white. They make a black gesso and they make colored gesso because many painting programs encourage you to not paint on a white surface. We'll get into that down the road because sometimes the white is so bright that all the darks, you know, it's hard to read your darks and your contrast. So many times we will, start off with a canvas that's a neutral tone. Like this is a canvas board. This is, um, you can you know buy these at Michael's. It's a, it's a board, but it's overlaid with canvas. And this I used gray gesso on. So I'm starting with a mid-tone. So here, when you're using a white surface, you only see the brights and the lights. You start with a mid-tone, whether it's gray, or whether it's green, a medium green. I've also done a number of paintings where I start with an all pink or an orange base, gesso base, because then from the medium color base, the mid-tone, you can go lighter, you can go darker. So your vision isn't skewed immediately with a bright white stark surface, 
you're coming in, your eyes are looking at a medium tone and you can go darker, you can go lighter. When you start with this, you could only go darker. You really can't go lighter than that. So I wanna give a quick gesso demo. Now, gesso- One, one question, uh, what, yeah. size, um, what size medium, uh, what size canvases or paper do you want us to have? Whatever you're comfortable with. This is an eight by 10. I mm -hmm. would go no smaller than six by eight or five by seven. You don't have to go, what is this like 12 by 16? You don't have to go that large. I usually mm -hmm. work large on my easel because I demo for you. I want to show you stuff large. But if you go like eight and a half, 11 or eight by 10 or nine by 12, that should be fine. That should be fine. And, and don't you want to need an easel. You want us to work on paper only or do you want us to buy some canvases? You don't need to buy canvases today. You may right. never want to buy a canvas. You may just want to work on heavy paper. I suggest canvas paper or watercolor paper that's like 140 pound. Mm -hmm. I would not work on copier paper that you know comes out of your computer that's just too Wait. flimsy it won't hold the paper it'll get all buckly and bacony and it'll what just... about sketch pads what about sketch pads are they okay um yes if, if it's got a nice heavy weight this is a sketchbook that you can paint in because the paper Mm -hmm. is substantial enough in fact let me see in my in my book here and what i what we're going to get into next week also this book actually is a lined notebook but the pages are heavy enough where i've made combinations of color and i write down the recipe this is ultramarine blue with naples yellow nice. so i make a little sampler for myself because I like to go back. Um, sometimes I forget, how did I make that color? I love that green, how did yeah. I make it? So I often like make little sampler recipes. Very so nice. I can go back and, and you can do that in a sketchbook. Mm -hmm. um, very often we use a sketchbook to record, we paint in a sketchbook for practice and to record. If you love that painting and you want to frame it or sell it or whatever, then you do have to think about how am I going to remove it from the sketchbook? Mm -hmm. When I get a sketchbook, I like to buy, I like to get the spiral bound. Let me take the cover off this. Yeah, perforated. Because, right, and also in the spiral bound, like this one, it has the spiral you can bend it back on itself mm -hmm. and then it will lay flat if you have a bound book like this is a bound book so then you have to worry about how you know how you're going to hold it open you're going to put a clamp there or a heavy object it's just easier if you have a spiral and you fold it over onto itself okay. um also having a sketchbook and keeping your record uh, and your um, exercises in your sketchbook gives you a sense of progression. So if you uh, put a little date at the bottom, you'll say, okay, well, this is what I did on April 19th. And then at the end of the, you know, the six weeks, you can say, oh, well, you know, I've come so far, look at where I am, you know, in May, whatever. So uh, yes, you can most certainly use a sketchbook. You can use just about anything. I will tell you that I have an artist friend who is a big upcycler. And Carolyn uses cracker boxes, cereal boxes. She cuts out the main panel so it's flat and she gessos it. And that is her substrate. Substrate is the word we use to describe what we're painting on, whether it's a canvas or a piece of paper or a piece of cardboard. Um, there are all kinds of surfaces out there now, 
chipboard and oh what's the other one they call it? is it a so board or something like that you've got um you know canvas boards you want something that is sturdy enough to hold up to the paint because acrylic paint can be used rather thickly uh -huh. and yeah. like if we bought a kind of watercolor pad that later in the class found out was not really a good quality one is that sort of perfect for acrylic then because it doesn't need sure. to do the things a watercolor pad needs to do right and also if you treated um the watercolor pad you're not crazy about if you put a coat of gesso on it then it really primes the surface to be what um what you need for it so what i'm going to do is i'm not going to do it on the white even though this is done with gray gesso i want to show you the color contrast so when we do gesso i'm just going to put some out here see how like it has it's a little milkier than toothpaste but it is still, you know, it's kind of like yogurty. And then if you can get other gesso that's super thick, I mean, that's like a uh, face cream or Noxzema or something like that. That's like a cream. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a large flat brush. This is maybe what, a two incher? And we always, when you work with the brush, you always dampen your brush. So I am, I am like put wetting it in water and just like tapping it off. And now I'm just going to prime my surface and I'll use this next week because it, it will take time to dry. And I'm just gonna move this gesso around and set it up as a prime, as priming my surface to receive the paint well at a later day. You want the gesso to dry, you want to move it around so it's smooth. And while I'm doing this, I'm going to start talking to you about brushes. There are a lot of brushes out there. You don't need every brush in every size. If we're doing, if we're painting large flat areas, then you would want a wide flat brush. Okay, I think this is pretty much even and I'm going to just set it aside to dry so I can continue talking about, where's my rag? There we go. Oh, here are, here are the gloves that I never put on. <laughs> that happens all the time. All right, now um, don't leave a brush sitting in water. You know, you can, just you know wipe it off it, it's going to hurt the bristles if you just you know keep it sitting there all the afternoon i like to give it a little rinse if i can't do a thorough washing right now i'm just going to put it you know wrap my wet rag around it so the paint doesn't dry on the on the bristles and then i'm going to wash it right after our class ends but i don't like to keep paint brushes sitting in a water, it's bad for the it's bad for the bristles. Now, when it comes to brushes, different brushes do different jobs. So I just have my little chart here. I will be sending you a follow up email. If you've taken my classes before, you know that I like to send you a little wrap up email after class. Goes over the high points of what we did in class. And I also um, attach a copy of the, the video that um, will be posted to my YouTube channel, which is Katie Goldberg Art, in case you want to look at the video again or you miss a class. And I also often send you a little article or a chart or um, today it's going to be all about brushes that will take you into a deeper dive into brushes. I'm just going to cover the basics, but the attachment, the handout that I'll be sending you via email will talk about all the, you know, the difference between um, a sable brush and a synthetic brush. And being that this is only an hour class, I'm not going to spend a whole hour on brushes. If you want to learn more about brushes, um, 
then you'll read the handout. But basically, um, there's a, different shapes to brushes. So we have a flat brush, like the one I just used for the gesso. And this is the kind that you can get like at a hardware store or at Target. Sometimes if we're painting large areas in a, in a wash or in a solid color, you can use a two inch brush. If you're doing a smaller area, and this is you know a flat square brush that will cover a lot of territory. You can, they also make like mop brushes that are more moppy if you're gonna do something um, with more uh, liquidy or um, what am I thinking of? Um, uh, not as thick paint. The Filbert brush has a rounded tip. A Filbert is great for blending. Here's a smaller version. Now acrylic brushes have stiffer bristles than watercolor brushes. You don't want to co-mingle your brushes. If you're painting with watercolor, keep those brushes separate from your acrylic brushes. Even when you go to the art supply store in the brush aisle, you'll see that they are media designated, the section for watercolor. Watercolor brushes are softer um, because the, the medium is just more liquid and softer. If you're using a heavy pot body paint, you want a stiffer brush that can hold the medium and not sag under the weight of the paint if it's too delicate of a brush. So you can get these in all different, this is a very small filter. Now brush size, the smaller the number, the smaller the brush. So this big fat Da Vinci is a size 24, where this little round brush, I think this is a 10. It got paint on it, so that might be a 10. Now a round brush is great for making strokes, like if you're doing lines and you're doing strokes. Uh, if you ever watched Bob Ross, you know that he loves his fan brush. And the fan brush is great for creating textures and uneven surfaces. Katie, I have a question. I unfortunately think my watercolor brushes got mixed up with my um, my my acrylic. How do you? Is there any way you can tell the difference? By the acrylic will probably be stiffer, and in many cases, on the wooden handle, it will say acrylic, or it could say watercolor. A lot of my brushes, I mean, some of this, this brush I've had since art school. And so that was goes back like 40 years or so. Um, this is a size 12, but it's held up beautifully over the years. Mm -hmm. Okay. If, if you make a good investment in brush, it should serve you well. Now, this is a Dick Blick size 14 red sable, but sometimes they get a little flared and fluffy which is okay um, because you want the paint uh, to stick to the brush. If the brush is too fine, you won't be able to manipulate the paint. So very often, if you go through your brushes, the ones that are super delicate will probably say watercolor. Sometimes they don't say anything and you just have to go by um, how they feel but many of them are marked acrylic or watercolor and so you i can tell will be skeptical of the fact that michael sells a lot of theirs saying it's for all of them like in that case is it good for any or those are all just junk right so what michael sells a lot saying for watercolor acrylic or tempura if it has it says it's good for them all but it's probably not right well it it's probably better for the heavier paint than it is for um, the lighter weight watercolor. Yeah. So if, if it says it's for everything, I'm sure that it'll be perfectly adequate for acrylic. 
Okay. Um, other brushes you could get are an angle brush. Those are if you're making, if you're doing architecture, like if you're doing a, a roof and you want to get a straight line and you're working at the beveled edge of the brush helps make a straight line. They also make a very thin brush and I have them mostly for watercolor. Let me grab one. See, I, my bin says watercolor only, so I don't commingle them. You can get a rigger or um, it's a, a very thin, long brush like this where it's made for fine lines and fine detail. So the larger the brush, it, you know, it only stands to reason, the larger the brush is for the, the proportionately the larger area that you're going to um, cover. You don't want to take a little, you know, number eight and start painting this whole thing. It'll take you all day. You'll get like tennis elbow trying to fill it in. So you want to uh, um, choose the appropriate brush for the coverage area. And again, you, you just need like one flat brush and um, for like doing washes or large expanses of color. I would say one round brush for making your shapes and doing your strokes. And you could get a rigor for fine lines. There's all kinds of boutique brushes you can get, like the dagger brush, which is fun. But in terms of basics, if you're just starting out, I tell people those three brushes and the three colors, red, blue, and yellow, on which we make all colors. So if you have, a surface, if you have paint, and if you have a brush, what I would like you to do is think about painting with me now and making for yourself a little sample. I'm going to try and remember to put my gloves on so my hands don't get all covered with paint. It's not so much that it ruins my manicure, it just aggravates um, my, uh, my eczema or my dermatitis because I use so much, I get involved with so many chemicals when I do art that they, they're not always friendly to my skin. Okay, so that I did that um, just so I put that somewhere to dry. Yeah, I think it's down there. So if you have, oh, I want to talk about palette really quick too. If you're using, a heavier bodied acrylic. Some people like to use palette paper, which is a pad. It's like waxy. It's almost like a jelly paper or a wax paper. And you can put a dollop of paint on there. If you're using, and it's like a palette. If you were using a hard palette, see how the paint, it's not moving around because it's heavy bodied. But when I add a lot of water to it, then this is going to like slide all over and drip. So if you're, you might want to use a plastic well palette. And what did I do with that? I just, I have everything so laid out perfectly before class. And then, then I start, touching things and moving things and where did I put it? Okay, let me grab one over here. I know I'll find it the minute the class is over with. So you can also get, you know, like one of these little plastic things. These, have um, the paint has hardened in it and I could probably peel it off, but if it was watercolor, I could just rinse it off. This will not rinse off. So what I'm going to do is just, I'm just going to, I wanted to demonstrate to you that the heavy body paint works great on um, the palette paper. But if it gets really wet, it's going to drip all over the place. 
depending on what you have for uh, where you paint, you might want to put down a drop cloth. I'm you always wet your brush before you don't want to put a dry brush into a gob of paint. It's not good for the brush. And you want to load up your paint on your brush. And you want to learn how to control the paint. So the best way to do that is to play with it. Get it out, get a brush, just do one color at a time and say to yourself, okay, I'm gonna load up my brush and I'm just gonna drag it across my surface. And you'll see, let me pick this up, where my paint was heaviest when I first started to drag it across, it got less heavy at the end. And that's the dry brush effect that when the paint is going out of, uh, you're losing the paint in your brush and it becomes kind of streaky and you can see the surface underneath, that's a great, um effect if you're doing like a stone wall or or a sand or some kind of surface that you don't want totally all opaque now the simplest thing to do when you're painting i'm gonna try and move this a little closer without upsetting the whole apple cart the simplest stroke to learn in painting is your basic wash, your gradient wash where you've got a lot of paint on your brush and you're starting at the top and you're gonna pick up the bead from the paint above it. See how we got like a bead going on there and you're just gonna go back over it and drag it down. So you're moving in one direction. I am not painting my dining room and going like this. I'm doing the paint in one direction and I'm trying to make it as smooth as possible. And then pick up a little bit more paint. Oh, see, this came off the pad, so it wants to buckle on me. I could even go for a larger brush here and if I add more water, I'm wetting my brush and I'm not dipping it back into the paint. We're gonna, oh, I'm getting drips. Usually when I paint, I paint flat unless I'm um, using a lot of heavy paint. But you can see now that you're getting a graduation. The more water, the more transparent your paint is going to become. So this is great for blending, like if you're doing a sunset and you want your colors, like your red and your yellow and uh, all that. It's a great way to practice blending. It is easier, I have found, I need a clamp, where's a clamp? Um, it is easier for me to do blending with fluid matte medium than it is with water. I have these clamps. Where's that clip? All right, well, I'm not gonna worry about it. I'll just take another piece. So whatever brush you have, I want you to practice with it. So that was my flat brush that's used to cover large areas. Now I'm going to take a round brush. This is, what size is this? This is a 10. It looks bigger than a 10. But that happens also depending on the manufacturer. The sizes can vary just like in dresses. You know, like you might be a size uh, eight in Ralph Lauren, but a size 12 in somebody else or something like that. So the sizes can vary. So you wanna, you know, um, build up your brush. Oh, and I wanted to go over the brush. The tip of the brush, is, you know, our tip, the middle of the brush is the belly. That's what really holds all the, um, the pigment. The metal clamp that holds the brush is called the ferrule and then you have the handle. Some artists really like 
long handled brushes and they like to stand away. Matisse used to um, tape his brushes to long sticks and paint, you know, three feet away because you can, you get a bigger gross motor movement. If you have the ability and the space to paint standing up with a big brush and get your whole arm into it, you'll find that your painting motion is freer. If you're sitting at a desk with a little brush and a little pad and you're all cramped up, you are gonna get cramped up. You're gonna get shoulder and neck issues and your you know, the arthritis in your fingers, whatever. But if you rely on a gross motor motion, it'll help you stay loose as a painter. So I would like you to play with your paints, make circles, and see what happens when the paint drags. See what happens when you add a lot of water to it and it starts to get drippy. Of course, it doesn't drip when I want it to drip. It drips when I, does, I don't want it to drip, of course. But the gravity of it all, come on, drip, come on. Drips can be fun. Um, some of my paintings have intentional drippage. That's such a word. I, now, of course, I can't get it to drip. <laughs> That's all I want. Every lesson I have an epic fail in some way or another. It always keeps me on my toes. There we go. There we go with the drips. Drips are fun too. Um, if you have more than one color, how am I doing for time? Oh, I got to wrap this up soon. If you have more than one color, I would like you to not only blend them together, but overlap them. Um, if you, grab a yellow, I thought I had one right here. Um, here's one. To see what happens, how sheer it is. So when one color goes over the top of another, I want you to see what happens. And this is good if you have a sketchbook like I showed you before, where you make a little swatch and you say, uh, okay, you know, this is, I'm adding cadmium yellow light and cobalt blue to make that green. And we're gonna go deeper into color next week. That's why I'm hoping by next week, you will have a red, a yellow, and a blue paint. And one of the things I will be sending you is a, um, a color wheel that we are going to paint next week. Does everyone have access to a computer printer? So if I were to send you something, you'd be able to print it out. Okay, because I'm, um, I'm gonna be sending you uh, the Newtonian, color wheel and we're going to color mix and fill it in together and learn about our primary colors and our secondary colors and our tertiary colors because that is one of the most important things you need to know about painting is how to mix your colors how to get the colors um and i just i just mixed this up and we're going to see how this reacts going over the orange even though this is considered a heavy body paint, it still is translucent enough where you can see the orange coming through that limey yellow color. So that's what I want you to play with. Um, and because everybody's probably got different supplies when I was teaching in-person art classes, I would bring all the supplies because I knew what I wanted everybody to be using. And I do hope to return to live in the fall, but I don't know if I'm gonna bring everything again. Maybe I'll bring some stuff, but I will have like a short supply list for people to bring. So Katie, for next week, we should definitely make sure to have red yellow and blue and red that yellow is. and blue yeah. uh, you don't need a whole bunch of fancy brushes you um i would say you know have a flat have a round yeah. there are also people that paint with palette knives 
oh, where's a power yeah. play? And that's where you um, are using, let me show you my knives here. Paint knives, palette knives. That's where you're really applying the paint almost like, um, like stucco where you're scooping up a heavy body paint and you're applying it with the edge and it makes really cool textures. And if it's super thick, it will go on like a stucco. It will have dimension. It will um, rise off off the paper. I have a three dimensional quality. So you don't always need a paintbrush to paint. One of, I just, I always like to tell my students, there are two sides to every paintbrush. There's the other end of the paintbrush too. And sometimes when your paint is wet, if, and this is great for landscapes, if I wanna get like tree branches or a suggestion of trees in the background, when the paint is wet, you can go back in and scrape into it with the end of your brush. And let me bring this in closer. See how I was able to scrape into it and create these lines with the end of my brush. So you don't always need to use a brush to be a mark making tool. Painting is not just using brushes. A lot of artists use um, scrapers. Um, some people take a corrugated box and rip it and drag it through their paint. So it, it makes like a, a rippled effect. There's so many things you can use to create these marks. So I'm running out of time here. To recap, we talked about the materials. We talked about paint, the different uh, paints, the heavy body, the fluid. Um, we talked about brushes, the different brushes and what they do and that you don't always need a brush that you can use other mark making tools to scrape around your paint and to make textures and our surfaces. Don't feel like you have to run out and buy a canvas. If you have a pad, that's fine. If, um, if you like the idea of upcycling your cereal boxes and your cracker boxes, I do recommend getting gesso, treating that cardboard surface with a coat of gesso because without it, the paint's just going to absorb into that cardboard and it, it, you're not going to be able to move it around the way you want it to. I'll be sending you um, a link to the video and um, a link to uh, brushes, more of an in-depth thing on brushes and a little peek into what we will be doing next week. And I'll be sending you the, ch the color chart, the color wheel chart that we'll be painting together next week and learning how to mix our colors. I do structure the course where every week we cover something, whether it's color, texture, line making, perspective. And then over the course of these weeks, we wrap it all up. Many people find that they like to spend the first couple of weeks doing the exercises and the last couple of weeks actually constructing a painting. And I like to keep it loose in the start because I don't want you to get that, uh, that pressure of having to create a masterpiece because then you're going to focus on the end result and not focus on the process. Painting is such fun. It's um, for many painters like myself, it's, it goes hand in hand with the other spiritual practices I do in my life, whether it's yoga or meditation or praying or walking in the woods. It's all part of that real feel good, yummy stuff that connects us to um, the world around us. Any questions? Okay. Yes, unmute I'm, yourself. Yeah. Oh, oh, I think I did. <laughs> you are. You're good. I went to uh, to, uh, to Thompson's Art Supply on Mamaroneck Avenue. Yes. Is that a good source? I mean, yes. In fact, they are one of the only 
real art stores left. AI Friedman is gone. All the, mm -hmm. a lot of mom and pop art stores are gone, but Thompson's on Marinick Avenue, they're still there. I'm glad yeah. they are. I'm glad. I showed are. them the, the list basically, and he ran and got the brush, the this, the that. Should we buy an easel or is a kitchen table? I don't have an easel. I mean, uh, you don't need an easel. And quite frankly, I don't normally paint with an easel, especially if I'm painting on paper. I use my easel for my really big canvases. But when I, um, I like to paint on a tabletop and I usually paint standing up. And I often paint with um, a pad or a watercolor block if I'm doing watercolor gouache. And I have a little something, even if it's a tube of paint, under the top of the pad so I have a very slight angle. So the pad might not be totally flat. It might be tilted 10 degrees maybe, but I like to paint standing up. I like to draw standing up. I just feel like I get a better perspective. I have that extra, distance and then I'm not all hunched up in my shoulders and arms and mm -hmm. neck and all that. And you can use a clipboard, right? Haven't you done that in other clips? Do you suggest a clipboard is just a- You can use a clipboard, clip. sure. You can use a clipboard. There's so much variety in your substrate and in whatever paint you use that I really want to adapt the class to what you have on hand rather than make you go out and make a big investment in all kinds of um, pads and canvases and all that. Another thing I wanted to share really quickly, if you have painted before and you don't particularly like the results of a painting, like this is what, this is something I don't like. I, I'm gessoing over this so I can use it again. I'm gonna cover it in gesso and start over. A lot of my canvases are like that, where I've, I've started a painting and I'm saying, this is not going the way I want it to. And I put it in the closet for a month and then I'll take it out and I'll just gesso it over and it's good as new. It's like whitewashing it. I'm not gonna be here next week. Next week I have something else. I, I have another commitment that I can't, it's a doctor's appointment. So are you going to send after next week's class, like, um, like um, a summary I'll record as well? It. I'll record okay. it. Oh, perfect. And then, okay. then I'll send you the, um, uh, you know, the link and awesome. whatever. So okay, that's so one I'm reason not that I, I wanted to give you, I wanted to let you know that I, I can't, I can't be here next week. Okay. I hope everything's all right. No, and no, no, no. I'm good. It's, it's a checkup, but. No, I don't I, mean to pry. I'm just sending you. No, no, no. Things are good. I, you know, I, um, I just, I can't, I can't rearrange this one appointment. I because these, this doctor in particular is so busy. It's crazy. These doctors. I know. I know. Okay. But, so you'll thank be getting you an so email me. Thank you all so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Please this contact is... me during the week if you have any questions. And I'll see you all next Tuesday afternoon. Have a wonderful thank day. You. Thank you. This is terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Bye now. Thank you.